Hey, it's me, Brandon. Welcome back to Geology Guy. Now today we're going to talk about igneous rock textures. Now remember, igneous rocks form when molten rock cools and crystallizes. Molten rock, by the way, has two names, magma and lava. When it's below the ground, we call it magma. Once it's erupted to the surface, we call it lava. But usually I will use the word magma to refer to either or. Unless I'm specifically distinguishing the two, then I'm going to be using the word magma quite a lot. The size of the mineral crystals that grow in the crystallized igneous rock is dependent on how quickly or slowly the magma cools. The slower the magma cools, the larger the crystals are going to be. And the faster it cools, the smaller the crystals are going to be. To illustrate, let me show you a little experiment I did with a sugary looking chemical called phenosalicylate. Okay, so this is how it looked when it finished crystallizing. There's a cool snowflake pattern within the crystals, but you can clearly see the shiny crystal faces themselves. They're quite large, maybe about half an inch. Okay, I'm going to do it again, but this time I'm going to cool it more quickly in an ice bath. So I messed this up a bit because the dish wasn't level in the ice bath, so one side still took long enough to cool that the crystals grew kind of big. But on the left side, it cooled very quickly, and you can barely even see any crystals. You can see these geometric shapes starting to form, but there aren't any clean, shiny crystal faces, like in the one that cooled slowly, which developed these cool rhombus crystals. So the same thing happens with molten rock as it cools and crystallizes. All right, let me get a couple of rock samples to show you what I'm talking about. Come on, focus, there you go. This is a rock that cooled from a lava flow. We call it an extrusive igneous rock because it cooled from lava. Ex comes from Latin, which means out of, and trude also comes from Latin, which means push or thrust. So this was pushed or thrust out of the ground. Now there are several types of ig extrusive igneous rocks with different minerals in them, and this one is called basalt. You can see it's a pretty dark rock. If I turn it here, you can see all of these holes in it, which I'll talk about what those holes are in a minute. But notice up close, there really you can't really even see any crystals in it. Any crystals that grew in it grew way too small, so small that you can't even see them with the naked eye. Now, if we were to take a very, very thin section of this and put it in a microscope, you would actually be able to see those crystals. But with the naked eye, those crystals are way too small. All right, let me grab another. Here's a couple of other examples. This is a rock called Tuff. Notice that in this one, you can see little chunks in here, but these chunks are, they're not crystals, they're pieces of rock that got embedded in this. But so the individual particles in here, the individual crystals, again, are too small to see with the naked eye. Same thing, very small crystals, can't see them with the naked eye. This was also a Tuff called the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. All right, let me grab another. Contrast the basalt with this rock called gabbro. This one cooled deep underground. So most of the minerals in it are the very same minerals as in the basalt, but notice the difference in their crystal sizes. This was an intrusive igneous rock because it was pushed or thrust into the ground. So move it around, you should be able to see it sparkle and shine there. That is showing off the different crystals. Whereas in the basalt, you couldn't see any of the crystals with the naked eye. This one, you can actually see those crystals. This one is a granite from Mount Rainier area. This one is also a granite, but this one comes from an area near Cody, Wyoming that is about 2 billion years old. Notice that in each of these, you can still see the crystals. Different chemical compositions, different colors, but the crystals are big enough to be seen with the naked eye. 
In both of those examples, the magma stayed deep under the earth, the ground insulated it, making it so that the magma cooled very, very slowly, allowing the crystals to form. And the other ones, where the crystals grow so small you can't even see them with the naked eye, it's because they erupted at the ground surface. They weren't as well insulated. And so therefore the crystals grow very, very small. You can't even see them. Okay, so you might be thinking, how fast is fast when it comes to cooling off? Well, Hawaiian lava flows usually can form a crust thick enough to walk on within only about 10 or 15 minutes. But the interior is well insulated by that crust, and so the interior of the lava flow can actually take several months to cool off. Hawaiian type lava flows are what produced this rock here that I showed you earlier. So this came from a place called Craters of the Moon, which is in eastern Idaho. A lot of lava flows that were actually very similar to the lava flows in Hawaii. And so a lot of this rock, even though you can't see the crystals with the naked eye, may have taken several months to cool. So the Oregon State University geology website talks about an area in Hawaii that filled in with lava, it was a kind of a depression, and filled in an 85 foot deep pond of lava. And as you can imagine, that probably took a little bit longer to cool off. 29 years afterwards, Geologists went in and drilled a hole down to collect rock samples, and they found that the very bottom was still warm and slightly mushy and not quite solid. 29 years. These are the extras of rocks, the ones that, that erupt out of the ground surface as lava and cools quickly to form fine grains so small that you can't even see them. What about the intrus of rocks? Well, a study in Nature Geoscience suggests that intrusive magmas take at least tens of thousands of years to cool and crystallize. They say, the transition from eruptible magmas to immobile granitic mush and pluton formation occurred in just 10 to 40,000 years. Okay, so geologists have actually come up with technical words to describe these different textures rather than saying fine-grained or coarse-grained or small crystals or large crystals. So, extrusive rocks, like this one, have an affinitic texture. So affinitic is a texture describing crystals that are too small to see with the naked eye. Intrusive igneous rocks have a phaneritic texture. So phaneritic describes a texture of igneous rock where the crystals are large enough to be easily seen with the naked eye but both intrusive and extrusive igneous rocks can have other textures as well. Remember this one, how it has the holes all over it? Here's another one with holes all over it. These have an affinitic texture, but they also have these holes. Now these holes were formed from bubbles, bubbles with gases, water, carbon dioxide, methane, sulfuric acid, different volatile compounds that were dissolved in the magma, that as the magma got close to the surface, these bubbles kind of expanded and tried to come out of the magma. And so they created these bubbles called vesicles. So each one of these bubbles is called a vesicle. And so this, in addition to having an affinitic texture, also has a vesicular texture. Another texture that extrusive rocks can have is a glassy texture. Rocks like obsidian have a glassy texture. Sometimes this is simply called volcanic glass. By the way, while editing this, I realized that I completely failed to explain why you get glassy textures like you do in obsidian. It's like affinitic rock. When it erupts out of the surface, it cools so quickly that the crystals can't form. But unlike affinitic, where the crystals do form, they're just very small. In volcanic glass, obsidian, glassy textures, the crystals don't form at all. They don't have enough time to form a perfect crystal lattice. And so they have at the microscopic scale, something we call an amorphous texture. So they don't even really have crystals. Another texture is pyroclastic. Pyro coming from, I think the Greek word for fire and clastic meaning rock fragment. So pyroclastic is a texture, something similar to this. If you were to look very carefully, you can see individual fragments in here. They're broken up fragments that came from an explosive eruption, hence fire rock. Here's another couple of examples of pyroclastic texture. This here is a small piece of rock that has a pyroclastic texture. You can actually see some of the very small fragments that have come together. These aren't individual crystals, they're just broken up piece of rock. And then here's another one. 
lots of small pieces of broken up fragments of rock that have all been welded together in an explosive eruption. Now what about rocks? When the magma deep inside begins to cool and crystallize, remember that takes tens of thousands of years, so it's beginning to cool and crystallize, and then an eruption happens and pulls some of that partially crystallized material out. That has a unique texture we call porphyritic. Here's an example of a porphyritic texture. All of these little white markings that look like scratches in the rocks are actually crystals, and the gray mass in between all of the crystals has an affinitic texture. So crystals that are surrounded by an affinitic mass make what we call a porphyritic texture. Here's another example of a porphyritic rock. It's hard to tell here, but I have a lot of these hornblende crystals, but then there's this real fine texture in between. So you can clearly see some of the large crystals, but most of these large crystals aren't actually touching each other. They're separated by an affinitic matrix in between. This whole texture has a porphyritic texture, meaning it has crystals large enough to be seen surrounded by an affinitic matrix. Okay, so to review, igneous rocks are classified by these different textures, which is essentially how large or small the crystals are and other textures that kind of give us a clue as to how this particular igneous rock was formed. Now remember, the deeper it is in the ground, the more slowly it's going to cool and the larger the crystals are going to be, forming a phaneritic texture. Above ground, it's gonna cool much more rapidly, giving us affinitic texture, where the crystals are too small to be seen with the naked eye. Extrusive rocks can also end up getting a very glassy texture if it cools super rapidly. And if it has bubbles all over it, it's a vesicular texture formed from gas bubbles that were in the, in the lava. Pyroclastic textures, form when the volcano erupts very explosively and results in small fragments of volcanic rock being welded together. And porphyritic textures form when partially crystallized magma then erupts, resulting in an affinitic matrix containing phaneritic crystals. Now this is one category that we use to classify igneous rocks. And in a future video, we'll talk about another category, which is chemical composition and the types of minerals that are in the different rocks. Hey, thanks for watching everybody. I hope this made igneous rock textures a little bit more interesting. If stuff like this is interesting to you, or especially if you're one of my students, please consider subscribing and I'll see you next time on Geology Guy. Thanks, take care.